Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Comet Interceptor. Uh, this is uh, the next uh, ESA uh, Comet mission or ESA with uh, JAXA uh, partnering with us. Um, so Comet Interceptor is the uh, first of ESA's F-Class missions. Now F-Class stands for fast, although this is uh, fast by ESA standards and not compared with any of the missions we've been hearing about this morning so far. Um, it is somewhere intermediate between uh, the smallest class of mission that ESA has previously done and their, their M class, which is more comparable with a, a, a NASA discovery, um, with a total budget of about 150 million euros uh, cost to ESA. Now that doesn't include the launch, and uh, as is typical with ESA missions, that also doesn't include the payload and the science operations, which are funded separately by the various uh, individual countries within uh, within Europe. Um, so this is a mission that is going to launch as a, a sanctuary payload along with the Ariel uh, Exoplanet Telescope, which goes to the Sunrise L2 point uh, in 2029. Um, originally proposed, this was going to be uh, about a ton. Um, we now have a limit at about 600 kilograms. Uh, the uncertainty on the available mass is largely due to the fact that we're going to launch with uh, Ariane 6, which is uh, ESA's new uh, launcher and hasn't flown yet, so there's still some uncertainty on performance. Okay, um, what do we want to do? We want to go to a new uh, comet, a long period comet, or possibly even an uh, interstellar object, um, and we want to do this because all comet missions so far have gone to periodic comets, uh, things that have gone past the sun a whole bunch of times. And we'd like to go and visit something that has not had those many uh, close passes to the sun and doesn't have the evolved surface that we've seen on uh, from previous comet missions. Um, and so ideally we're going to something dynamically new um, and this will be a really pristine object, something that has not seen the heat of the sun since uh, the formation of the solar system. Uh, now that's kind of a challenging thing to do uh, because obviously by definition a new comet coming in, we don't know where it is yet, it's not yet been discovered um, and therefore you can't plan a trajectory uh, to your target. Uh, and so to get to a, a new target like this, we need to discover it uh, on its way in uh, with enough time to get there. Um, we heard already about uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory and the LSST, um, how this is going to vastly increase our discovery rates of, of all solar system objects. Um, we don't think it's necessarily going to find uh, more comets that come to 1AU than the uh, than we currently find, but what it will do for this sort of case is it will find them a lot further out. And that will give us a lot more warning time uh, to prepare and get uh, spacecraft in the right place. However, uh, even with that, you still won't give us enough time to plan, build, launch a spacecraft. Um, so what we're having to do is we're having to design the spacecraft to be able to cope with a whole variety of situations launch it to a, a nice place in space to park and wait, and uh, then be able to respond relatively rapidly to a discovery and reach a, a target within a few years of discovery. Okay, to kind of illustrate what we're going to do. So as I said, we launched to uh, the uh, Sun-Earth L2 point with Ariel. Um, this is a convenient place to park in space, which is why uh, Ariel and JWST and various other telescopes go there. Um, and we'll wait there for up to a few years uh, following launch um, until a target is discovered. Um, meanwhile, uh, and actually before launch, um, various ground-based facilities are going to be searching the skies, particularly LSST, and when they pick up a, a suitable target, um, we then uh, can predict where this is going to cross the, uh, the ecliptic and find one that's going to get to the right place within the period uh, that we operate for. Um, we then depart from L2 uh, to get ourselves in the right place at the right time, and we have a fast flyby of our comet as it crosses the plane um, some point within uh, five or six years of the, of the launch of the mission. Um, 
This will be a fast flyby mission, uh, not a rendezvous uh, like Rosetta. Um, and because this, uh, there's no way energetically that we can match orbits with these things, but uh, this will be a brand new target and therefore give us a, a lot of new information. Now it comes with a lot of challenges. Um, as I said, this is gonna be a fast flyby. And if this is a comet on a retrograde orbit coming out of the Oort cloud, then the encounter velocities can be sort of 70 kilometers a second or, or more in the worst case. Um, and you're flying, going to fly through a, a coma of uh, dust and gas at these sort of speeds. That is uh, an engineering challenge. Um, we have quite uh, strong cost caps. So this means the whole mission has to uh, finish within five or six years, um, just from an operations point of view. Um, we have various solutions we can do with this. So the, the dust shielding is, uh, is an engineering challenge, but not an, uh, an insurmountable one. Um, the Giotto mission back in the 80s went to Halley. Halley's a retrograde orbit, it met a, a comet at that sort of speed. So if we, can, we know that uh, we can build a spacecraft to survive that sort of encounter. Um, we're going to be limiting our weight at uh, the L2 point about three years. And if we're unlucky and we haven't uh, discovered a suitable comet by that, that point, we have a list of uh, backup targets and known Shopier comets that we can reach. And we can add new science um, even on a, on a short period comet, even though that's, that's not the primary goal of the mission. Um, and there are some interesting targets within our backup list. Uh, 73P uh, with the image here uh, is one of them. And that's a, a very interesting target from a comet point of view. However, um, we are confident that we're going to get to a, a new long period comet coming in. Um, one of the other novel things about Comet Interceptor um, that will be novel even if we do go to backup target is that the, the ESA F-class call encouraged uh, multi-point measurements, so multi-spacecraft uh, investigations. Um, now that's a very useful thing to do at a comet because it means that we can have, uh, we can probe different places within the, uh, the comet's coma at, at the same time. And this allows us to separate out what's varying uh, with time and what's varying um, spatially. And that's something we couldn't do with the, even with Rosetta because of course it was measuring only at one place at a time. And so you never knew where the changes you saw were due to uh, the coma being uh, uh, inhomogeneous or whether or not this was because it took time to move from place to place. Um, and so we're gonna have simultaneous measurements at different places in the coma and different views of the nucleus, um, and particularly uh, crossing different places in the, the magnetic in field interacting between the comet and the solar wind. Um, the other reason why it's very useful for a comet flyby, of course, is that it means that we can separate out a relatively uh, safe and relatively distant flyby from the, from the mothership, from the main spacecraft, um, and ensure um, that the mission is, is safe and, and survives the encounter while sending uh, smaller probes uh, closer into the nucleus, into the inner coma, where they, have a, they take higher risks but get uh, closer up measurements. And so uh, Comet Interceptor is made up of three spacecraft. Um, the, the primary spacecraft and one of these small probes are provided by ESA, and then one of the other small probes is provided by JAXA. Um, to show how this works during our flyby, so our main spacecraft, one called spacecraft A, is uh, furthest away, around about a thousand kilometers uh, closest approach uh, distance to the nucleus. So within the coma of the comet, but not in the, the most dangerous region in the very inner coma. Um, and that contains um, mostly um, heritage, uh, sort of full size instruments um, from various previous missions. That is that gives us our, our, uh, our main goals, even if the other smaller spacecraft uh, fail. Um, and then the small spacecraft are released kind of a day before the encounter uh, and pass through the inner coma. And they are sending data back, real time back to the main spacecraft, which then down links that to Earth. And so the small spacecraft are designed to be uh, expendable, but they are, they, they will, uh, they're expected to operate up to the closest approach point, but uh, anything that they get beyond that is a bonus. 
Uh, okay, so what have we got on board? Um, so this is the, the current payload. Uh, we are still in the kind of uh, design iterations on this. This may change slightly, um, but the payload as we expect to fly at the moment is uh, the primary uh, camera on the main spacecraft is COCO. Uh, this is based on the Cassis instrument on uh, the Trace Gas Orbiter in orbit around Mars. Um, it's essentially a, a direct copy of that, although with a filter wheel added. Um, we have a mass spectrometer called Maniac, which is uh, based on heritage from the Rosetta and Resina uh, uh, instrument. Um, we also then have a remote sensing uh, camera in the infrared. So this has three channels, uh, a near infrared imaging channel, a, uh, spectrom a point spectrometer channel covering mid infrared range uh, where there are uh, lots of emission features in coma gases and absorption features on any surface ices, and then also a, a thermal infrared imager, um, which will be the first time we've taken any sort of thermal IR uh, camera to a comet. So that's a, an interesting uh, element in itself. And then finally, our, our last package is uh, this dust fields plasma package. So this is one instrument that made up of uh, multiple sensors, and this deals with the in situ measurements of uh, dust, and then also the, uh, the plasma and the uh, magnetic uh, interaction around the comet with the, the solar wind. Um, on the B1 spacecraft, so this is the one provided by JAXA, uh, this carries a, a UV, a far UV imager, uh, which is uh, a reflight of the uh, UV imager that was on the uh, Procyon uh, Leica um, mini spacecraft that launched with Hybris 2. Um, so this is designed to take images uh, in the hydrogen lime and alpha, gives us water production rate and uh, maps of large scale coma. Um, we have a, another suite of uh, plasma measurements on here, a magnetometer and a mass, an ion mass spectrometer based on uh, instruments on Bepi Colombo. And then there's two cameras, wide angle monochrome camera, and then also a, a narrow angle camera to give us high resolution at, uh, at closest approach. Um, this is a particularly interesting experiment because the, uh, the JAXA spacecraft is three axis stabilized and won't track the nucleus as it flies by. And so the, uh, the nucleus is only actually in the field of view of the narrow angle camera for a quarter of a second. Um, but this is a sort of ambitious uh, thing that we've got used to JAXA doing and JAXA pulling off. So we're quite sure that that will get some amazing images in their very narrow window. Um, on the B2 spacecraft, so this is the, the ESA supplied uh, small probe, we have an uh, instrument called ENVIS, which is mapping the, the whole coma. So B2 is a spin stabilized platform, and as it rotates, uh, this instrument is looking out the side of the spacecraft and then building up a, a scan of the entire sky as the uh, spacecraft rotates in a series of uh, imaging filters and polar metric filters. So this will get a uh, information on gas and dust in the inner coma. We also have another camera looking forward past the, uh, the dust shield on the front of the, the spacecraft, um, which gives us a sort of forward looking view. Um, uh, and then we also have uh, sort of uh, part of this dust field and plasma package um, on this spacecraft as well, which gives us our multi-point measurements of dust measurements and, magnet and magnetic field measurements from multiple places. Uh, so these are instruments that are the same as the ones on spacecraft A, uh, measuring from a different place. Okay, just a quick update on where we are. Uh, so this was, we were selected in uh, June 2019. Um, in late 2019, uh, we had these uh, concurrent design facility studies with ESA to confirm that the, the concept was feasible. It was formally selected in February of 2020, uh, moved to phase A. Um, now, this is the reason why FAST for ESA is not FAST in the same way that it is elsewhere in the world, is that now that industry is then invited to uh, do their own designs. So we now have a competitive phase A with two different industrial consortia uh, led from um, OHB and Talos Alenia, leading two different consortia, both designing uh, the spacecraft in phase A, which will go on for the next year or so, and in parallel, the instruments are going through uh, their IPRR. And so the timeline going forward, um, we have the first, uh, the, the, the 
preliminary review for the spacecraft design uh, coming up in March. We then have uh, a series of further reviews of the instrument and the spacecraft uh, separately at SSR and PDR levels uh, in later this year and first half of next year. And then the final uh, sort of choice of which uh, design we go for, which uh, uh, industrial uh, consortium is selected for build, and the final confirmation that we are actually definitely doing the mission um, is so-called adoption by ESA at the, uh, the meeting of their, their science programs committee in aiming at June 2022. Um, so from there, we actually then move into the implementation phase um, through 2024 for the next review and then delivery of spacecraft by mid 2028, um, ready for it to uh, be uh, waiting for, for Ariel to be ready and launching in 2029. Um, and then I said that leads then to a few years waiting in space and a comet encounter at some point before 2035. Um, so that's a, a quick uh, update on the comet interceptor. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, if you want to find out more, that's our website or Twitter address. And uh, yeah, I'll stop there and take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Colin. Um, there is one question um, by Joel Marx. This appears to be exactly what would be needed for a LPC or ISO, um, possibly heading for collision with Earth. Have you considered extrapolations to a reconnaissance and then deflection or disruption situation? Um, so it certainly would be an interesting thing to, to use a similar concept uh, for planetary defense or to go to uh, an interstellar object, um, even one that was, you know, not a threat. Um, the main limitation we have on, on this particular mission is that it has a, a fairly limited mass and therefore limited delta V capability. Um, whereas if, so we have to be very lucky to get to anything interstellar, it has to be in the right place at the right time. Um, but certainly the idea of, you know, using this as a proof of concept and then developing a similar uh, mission concept with a, you know, a dedicated launch and a, and a larger uh, Delta V capacity to do uh, an ISO mission is something that we, yeah, we've definitely thought about as a future idea. Thank you. 